part of this chemical family, if you want to put it that way. I mean, the, the prototype compound in some ways is DMT, which is the simplest dimethyltryptamine. And 5-methoxy-DMT and is DMT with a methoxy group in the 5 position. And uh, it is similarly, if you smoke it, it's uh, very rapid like DMT, in some ways more profound than DMT, although without any, without any or very little visual effect. So you get the feeling of acceleration, the feeling of you know, transcendence and uh, all that, but without really prominent uh, visuals, which is kind of the, the overwhelming aspect of DMT. It's extremely visual and it's what you're seeing, but a lot of, uh, 5-methoxy is more what you're feeling, you know, and uh, sense that you are taken out of your body and you're taken or you go somewhere. Um, I mean, you know, the, the most memorable 5-methoxy experience I had, I, I can remember that I, when I smoked it, I had the feeling that I was completely removed out of my body and I went to a realm where I, I was either, I was part of kind of the community of all souls, you know, the community of all entities that had ever lived and ever died, you know, and I could feel, you know, in a sense, the pain and suffering of all, you know, intelligent entities. Uh, but, you know, that had been suffered throughout history uh, but at the same time, it was reassuring. It was like, it was like, okay, yes, but this is part of it, you know, it's okay, you know, that all this has taken place because this, uh, this is the way we are. And, uh, yeah, and, and psilocybin is chemically, it's, uh, well, psilocybin is the inactive form of psilocin. Psilocin is what's doing it. Psilocin, psilocybin is converted to psilocin in the body. Uh, and so it's what pharmacologists call a prodrug, an inactive form that's converted in the body to the active form. And it's psilocin. So psilocin is 4-hydroxy DMT, right? So these trivial molecular differences, 5, a methoxy group in the 5 position or a hydroxyl group in the 4 position makes all the difference in terms of both whether they're orally active or whether they're, and their pharmacokinetics, you know, how they're, how they're cross, cross into the blood-brain barrier, how long they stick around and how quickly they're metabolized out. It's the neurotransmitter that all these things work, to, work on. And serotonin is a tryptamine like these things are. Serotonin being 5-hydroxy tryptamine, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's a tryptamine. It's part of this family and all the hallucinogens, not just DMT, but psilocybin, but LSD, and even mescaline, all work on these serotonin receptors primarily. So yeah. It's the psychoactive substance that, uh, you know, maintains consensus reality, you know. I mean, we're all high on serotonin. We're experiencing the serotonin hallucination even as we speak, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I mean, not just serotonin, obviously, but all, but yeah, I mean, but serotonin, we're learning now how much it has to do as it's kind of the master neurotransmitter that has so much to do with, uh, uh, you know, what we think of as consciousness, you know, perception, obviously, because we can profoundly alter perception with these hallucinogens, but also, <clears throat> you know, sleep, circadian rhythm. Uh, eating behavior, um, you know, sexual behavior, uh, depression, mood, all that, you know, uh, the selective serotonin uptake inhibitors work because they work on 
serotonin. So serotonin, yeah, is uh, very important. It, it, it's found in all the parts of the brain that we kind of pretty much know or think we know has to do with what we experience as consciousness. There's been a lot of research on cannabis in, in the last 20 years and mainly what they found is there are actual cannabinoid receptors, you know, in, in the brain and not only in the brain but all over the body. And it's different than the so-called monoamine neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine. Um, but um, you know, cannabis, the cannabinoid receptors mediate all kinds of things all over the body, everything from gut react, gut functions to the immune system to, you know, sleep and, you know, many different things. Because these cannabinoid receptors, and, you know, we now know what the endogenous, the so-called endogenous ligand for the cannabinoid receptors are. Um, it's, a, it's a fatty acid derivative called uh, anandamide. It was named anandamide. Uh, it, it, you know, it's part of the prostaglandin pathway. Um, so we, we know what that is, um, and we know it has multiple functions. And so, you know, it, it's not surprising <clears throat> that as a medicine, cannabis affects so many different processes, you know, both in the brain and, and in other parts of the body. That's why it has so many different types of activity because these cannabinoid receptors are all over the place. And so the idea that, you know, cannabis is not medicinal or, or can't be medicinal is just bunk. I mean, that is a political statement, not a scientific one. You know, if it's not medicinal, then why are pharmaceutical companies, you know, furiously developing analogs of can cannabinoids you know, for everything from, you know, uh, immune stimulants to cancer treatments. Uh, you know, I mean, ask, ask the pharmaceutical companies if they think it's medicinal. Of course it's medicinal. Not, unfortunately, patentable. <laughs> so that's why they're busy making all these synthetic analogs of cannabinoids, because they are patentable. Um, but, you know, the idea that uh, cannabis isn't a medicine is, uh, you know, just a, a political statement based on uh, no science at all, you know. Uh, and, you know, people say, well, you know, we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't develop, we shouldn't allow cannabis to be used as a medicine, we shouldn't develop cannabis as a medicine or permit it as a medicine because it sends the wrong message to our children, uh, or whatever that means. I mean, the message it sends to our children is we're too stupid to take a perfectly good medicine and develop it as, a, as something that will benefit people. I mean, if we're going to apply that standard, you know, half the drugs in our pharmacopoeia are potentially abusable. And, you know, I don't know any doctors that would want to say, well, we should get rid of morphine, you know, because it sends the wrong message to our children because people get addicted to morphine. Well, of course they do. But I don't know of any doctor that would want to get rid of morphine, you know, for that reason. It's too valuable as a medicine. Mm -hmm.